Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Kulda Sumro. I am a final year medical student at Dow University of Health Sciences in Karachi, Pakistan. My topic today is abdominal epilepsy. Today we will be going over what abdominal epilepsy actually is, what abdominal seizures actually mean, the diagnosis of it, treatment, uh, a case study, and then we'll just summarize everything and conclude. So what is abdominal epilepsy? It is considered to be a temporal lobe epilepsy that presents with an abdominal aura. What does this mean? It means that there is an uncommon cause of recurrent abdominal pain that includes a paroxysmic episode of abdominal pain. Now, what that actually means is that a patient has a seizure disorder and they are presenting with symptoms that are GI symptoms. So there's a spectrum of both CNS and GI manifestations. The presenting picture usually has a patient who has chronic or recurrent episodes of symptoms and also has neuropsychiatric manifestations. These episodes can last anywhere from five to 20 minutes and they occur randomly multiple times a day and it usually creates a pain that centers around the belly button. Abdominal epilepsy is a subset of temporal lobe epilepsy. Epilepsy on its own as a general disease affects more than 70 million people worldwide. 60% of those are idiopathic cases. This subset is an extremely rare condition and review of the literature yields only about 36 cases that have been reported in the past 34 years. So it's extremely rare. Um, it is better documented in children and it's recognized very infrequently in adults. The main diagnostic criteria, the way that we characterize it, is that there's usually unexplained prox proxisomal GI complaints that includes radiographic imaging and endoscopy. And it usually has symptoms of a CNS disturbance. There are abnormal, abnormal EEG findings that are specific for a seizure disorder. So specifically on an EEG, you will see a high voltage, slow wave that has generalized spike and wave discharges, and the, or you'll see a local abnormality, particularly in the temporal lobe. It's usually a, a tumor or any kind of growth. Um, and the fourth criteria would be that there is improvement with anticonvulsant drugs. In this picture of an EEG, uh, we do have the right temporal parietal spikes. Uh, this is seen in patients who present with abdominal epilepsy, and I'll go more into detail in a little bit on this. So the causes. Um, so causes for abdominal epilepsy have not been solidified yet. There are multiple theories on why it happens or how it happens. One of the biggest ones right now is that there is an autoimmune manifestation. Essentially what happens is that if you have a patient who has a new onset refractory seizure, um, it'll have subacute progressive cognitive decline and they'll also present with behavioral or psychiatric dysfunction. The antibodies associated with the autoimmune type include uh, LGI1, NMDA, and GAD65, and that is important when we consider how we treat these specific subsets. Um, this is also really important in the sense that we can also check for these specific antibodies. However, there's no conclusive evidence that says that if this antibody is positive, that it is immediately positive for this type of epilepsy, but it does help the physician find or, or at least be able to exclude certain um, syndromes. Another really important part of it is that the gut microbiome has a very important relationship with the brain. If there is any changes in the ratio um, in the glutamate and GABA ratio, that can cause an excitatory, fact, um, an excitatory effect on the brain. And it, also the production of short chain fatty acids and serotonin can actually inhibit epileptic episodes. And the epilepsy producing metabolites will increase the secretion of inflammatory markers, which in turn can increase inflammatory cytokines and that causes the ratio to get messed up. Um, and then the third most important cause is that if the patient already has temporal lobe epilepsy or has a uh, tumor that they usually can find on an MRI. 
most common symptoms. So the symptoms that you'll see in a patient who presents with abdominal epilepsy is a abdominal pain. It's usually sharp or cramping and it'll last anywhere from seconds to minutes. And that's one of the biggest ways we can differentiate it from other subsets of either epilepsy or um, abdominal syndrome, such as abdominal migraine. Patient will also present with nausea and vomiting, fatigue, lethargy, and sometimes even sleep, uh, sleep following seizures. There's an altered level of, con uh, altered level of consciousness, uh, so for confusion or unresponsiveness, such as we see in a lot of seizure types. Um, and then the CNS manifestations can be anywhere from confusion, fatigue, headache, dizziness, and even syncope. Diagnosis is one of the ways that a lot of areas are diagnosing abdominal epilepsy is by putting it under a subset of autoimmune epilepsy, which is what abdominal epilepsy is also known as. Um, the way to do it is to do an APE score, um, which is an antibody prevalence of epilepsy. Um, using the score, you're able to evaluate for the specific neural antibodies um, and then decide if you want to proceed with either immuno, uh, immunotherapy or if you want to um, see what whatever the effect is of that outcome for the immunotherapy. And depending on what score it is, will define whether it's a possible, probable, or definite autoimmune epilepsy. So diagnostic criteria. Um, so for this specific subset, children are more likely to either be diagnosed, and there's a lot more studies done on pediatric epilepsy. Um, however, for my, um, for my case, I wanted to focus on the adult side of it. Um, so pediatric abdominal symptoms that can't be explained after extensive medical testing is usually the way that they're able to find it out in a peds patient. Um, however, there's also symptoms such as CNS symptoms that cause lethargy or confusion and abnormal EEG and a sustained absence of abdominal symptoms while all still taking the epilepsy medication. Um, this is a diagnosis of exclusion most of the time. So CT scans of the abdomen, brain, MRI of the brain, and an ultrasound of the abdomen usually don't show anything. It usually will all come up normal. Um, so this is also an EEG. So what it shows is that right here um, in the temporal area, it shows a spike and wave, and that is what is diagnostic of this specific epilepsy um, because it is showing the spike and wave pattern at the temporal lobe, which is why it's associated with the temporal lobe epilepsy. The way that we can differentiate abdominal epilepsy for, from something like irritable bowel syndrome is there's the presence of altered consciousness during some of the episodes uh, and a tendency towards being tired after an episode and an abnormal EEG. An abnormal migraine would present with something that is a longer a longer in duration and they won't present with symptoms such as sleeplessness or anything like that. Um, so that's how we kind of differentiate between the two. Um, and it's also uh, the EEG is the biggest uh, differentiation between the two. So uh, most important treatments include uh, anti-convulsant medication and a resolution of symptoms will help confirm diagnosis. Now with this, it is not necessary that the anti-convulsant medication will be able to completely remove the uh, epilepsy. What this means is that it's not necessary that the seizure disorder will be treated um, because approximately 60% of seizure disorders are treated and are, um, are not going to continue having seizures if they are treated with seizure, seizure medication. Um, some of the medications that we use in this disease uh, are trileptal and valproic acid. We can also use immunotherapy. In patients who are resistant to medication, we also are able to use a ketogenic diet, which means that we are able to uh, re help reduce the glutamate, uh, which is the excitatory uh, neurotransmitter, and then enhance the synthesis of GABA. Challenges with patients like this is that treatment can be difficult because primary care physicians will take the time to look for a physical cause. With that, there's a lot of investigations, a lot of blood work, a lot of scans, and they'll all come back normal or they'll, um, this can be really grueling on a patient and a lot of times patients might not even be compliant to continue doing the investigations. 
All abdominal imaging and tests must first be conducted to rule out physical cause. Um, but what ends up happening is that doctors usually will end up referring the patient to a psychiatrist. And uh, unfortunately, because there is such a stigma around psychiatry, the patient may avoid going because it might seem like something that they can just deal with. Um, also, which is unfortunate, is that there is a higher incidence of misdiagnosed conversion disorder, especially with a uh, identifiable trigger such as low socioeconomic status. Okay, so we'll go into a case study and kind of talk about that. So for this case, it is a 45-year-old female with no past significant medical or psychiatric history. She presents with multiple clustered episodes of abdom abdominal pain for one year, and each pain has intense abdominal pain that's in the right iliac fossa and radiates to the umbilical area. Each episode will last about 10 to 15 minutes, and there are 5 to 10 episodes each day. This is very different from how normal epilepsy will present, which presents it's not necessary that that patient will have a seizure every single day. With abdominal epilepsy, the patient will have multiple episodes throughout the day, um, or at least one a day. Um, usually, this episode is associated with non-projectile vomiting, and it can also occur with a severe frontal headache and extreme anxiety. This particular patient underwent the relevant examinations, uh, had biochemical examinations, uh, ultrasonography, CT, endoscopy, all ended up being normal. She also underwent a trial of antidepressants that was carried out, um, but there were no improvement patient symptoms. Patient was then referred to a psychiatrist. During the clinical examination, the psychiatrist found that the patient is tachycardic, has hypertension, and between each episode, patient was still tachycardic. Um, the MMSC had a intact sensorium, distressed affect, um, and a preoccupation with symptoms, but there was no perceptual disturbance. Neurologic exam also was within normal limits during the episode, and that included plantar reflexes, pupils, and fundi. So during this time when the patient was meeting with the psychiatrist, she was provisionally diagnosed with panic disorder with depressive features and a pheochromocytoma was considered. The pheochromocytoma was ruled out due to a normal 24-hour VMA and seromedonephrines. There is an abnormal um, migraine and porphyria was considered and that was also ruled out due to the duration of episodes because those episodes will be shorter. Abdominal epilepsy was considered and the EEG, in fact, did show the spike and slow wave complex in bilateral temporal leads. The patient was started on sodium valproate, sustained release 600 milligrams in two divided doses. And in conclusion, abdominal epilepsy is a rare form of temporal lobe epilepsy. It does manifest as ap episodes of abdominal pain nausea, vomiting, and it's followed by a loss of consciousness and post-ictal sleepiness. The occurrence is rare, and as we saw in the previous case, uh, it is often misdiagnosed as psychogenic pain or conversion disorder. After all of these abnormal conditions are ruled out, an EEG may help find the abnormal brain activity. The most important takeaways from this case and overall what abdominal epilepsy is, is that there needs to be a consultation liaison psychiatrist that operates in general and surgical practices. Um, because of this, there are various diagnoses and investigations that focus on the metabolic, cardiovascular, and GI system before the patient was referred elsewhere. Um, and even now, that patient was specifically referred to a psychiatrist because of suspected somatization and hysterical symptoms rather than the abdominal epilepsy. In the most recently conducted review that was done by Zinkin and Peppercorn, they covered 36 cases that have been reported in the literature so far. The classic presentation that was seen in these cases includes an abdominal pain that is periumbilical, either left, upper, and right lower quadrant, and there is varying intensity and quality. It's usually associated with nausea and vomiting. And the most common neurological sim symptoms in most cases included the post-ictal lethargy, the drowsiness, generalized tonic-clonic seizures, sweating, paresthesias, pain, and even blindness. With that being said, 
Th that's not the only way that it can present. It can also present with an absence, a confusion, um, and overall um, the same symptoms that would present with a patient who does have the seizure disorder without any abdominal manifestation. Okay, that's everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um